premise of the internet is freedom. Freedom of expression, freedom of organization, freedom of assembly. These are really seen as the underpinning rights of what we see as democratic values. Just because you have safety does not mean that you cannot have freedom. Just because you have freedom does not mean you cannot have safety. Why is the reaction to doubt it rather than to assume that it's true and act accordingly? We need to be able to break those laws that are unjust. Privacy in essence becoming a de facto crime. That somehow you're hiding something. So just to be sure, let's not have any privacy. Before the internet came about, um, communication was generally one editor to many, many readers. Um, but now it's peer-to-peer. -peer. So, you know, at a touch of a button, people have um, opportunity to reach millions of people. It's revolutionizing the way we communicate. One of the things that Facebook, and to a lesser degree Twitter, allowed people to do is be able to see that they weren't alone and it was able to create a critical mass and I think that that's a very important role that social media took on. It was able to show people in a very easy way in people's Facebook feeds, oh wow look at Tahir Square, there's people out there and in Bahrain and Pearl Square in which people could feel before walking out their door into real life action that they could see that they were not in, that they were not isolated in their their desire for some sort of change the great promise of the internet is freedom where the mind is without fear and the head is held high and the knowledge is free because the promise was this will be the great equalizer before the social web before the web 2.0 anything you were doing was kind of anonymous by the very concept of anonymity, you were able to discuss things that would probably be not according to the dominant themes or the dominant trends or values of, of your own society. Ja, ich finde diese Diskussion um die Frage, wie man mit der Behauptung, ich habe nicht zu verbergen, umgeht, auch nach vielen Jahren. Ähm, Keineswegs äh, langweilig oder so, denn dieser Satz ist sehr kurz, aber sehr perfide. Der Sprecher, der mir den Satz, ich habe nichts zu verbergen, entgegenschleudert, der sagt nicht nur was über sich selbst, sondern er sagt in der Regel auch was über mich. Denn dieser ich habe nichts zu verbergen Satz, eigentlich oft, äh, ohne dass es ausgesprochen wird, die Komponente, du doch auch nicht, oder? Insofern finde ich diesen Satz auch immer ein Stück solidaritätslos, weil man ja sich gleichzeitig nicht dafür einsetzen will, dass der andere, der vielleicht was zu verbergen hat, das kann. One of the things about privacy is that it's not always about you. It's about the people in our networks. And so for example, I have a lot of friends who are from Syria. Um, people that I've met in other places in the world, not necessarily refugees, people who've lived abroad for a while, um, but those people are at risk all the time, both in their home country and often in their host countries as well. And so I might say that I have nothing to hide. I might say that there's no reason that I need to keep myself safe. Um, but if you've got anyone like that in your network, any activists, any people from countries like that, it's thinking about privacy and thinking about security means thinking about keeping those people safe too. Privacy is important because if we think of the alternative, if everything is public, if the norm is public, then anything that you want to keep to yourself has an association of guilt attached to it. And that should not be the world that we create. That's a chilling effect. It's a chilling effect on, on, on our freedoms. It's, it's a chilling effect on democracy. For me, human rights are something which has been put in place to guarantee 
the freedoms of every single person in the world. They're supposed to be universal, indivisible. Having those rights makes you human in the eyes of this system. They're collecting data and metadata about hundreds of thousands, millions of people. And some of that data will never be looked at. That's, that's a fact, we know that. But at the same time, assuming that just because you're not involved in activism or you're not well known, that you're not going to be a target at some point, I think that's what can be really harmful to us. Right now, you may not be under any threat at all, but your friends might be, your family might be, or you might be in the future. And so that's why we need to think about it this way, not because we're going to be you know, snatched out of our homes in the middle of the night now, but because this data and this metadata lasts for a long time. My observation is that we are currently experiencing that the der, der private Raum, also the Raum der in the digital world, ne, um, privat äh, sein und bleiben sollte, ähm, langsam ähm, zu erodieren beginnt, beziehungsweise durchlässig äh, zu werden beginnt. Und zwar nicht nur faktisch, faktisch natürlich klar, aber nicht nur faktisch, sondern auch in der Wahrnehmung. Ich stelle mir die digitale Welt vor wie ein Panoptikum. Ja, das ist dieses von Jeremy Bentham entworfene ähm, ringförmige Gebäude. In dem Ring sind in den einzelnen Zellen die Häftlinge untergebracht und in der Mitte ist ein Wachtturm. Und da sitzt ein Wachtmann und dieser Aufseher, der kann die Häftlinge, die Zellen um ihn herum die ganze Zeit beobachten und überwachen. Und der Trick dabei ist, dass die Häftlinge nicht wissen können, ob sie gerade beobachtet werden. Die sehen nur den Turm, aber die sehen nicht den Aufseher. Aber die wissen ganz genau, dass sie jederzeit permanent beobachtet werden können. Und diese Tatsache übt eine verändernde, entscheidende Auswirkung auf sie aus. I think surveillance is a, is a technology of governmentality. It's a technology, it's a biopolitik political technology. It's there to control and manage populations. It's really propelled by state power and the power of entities that are glued in, that cohere around the state, right? So it's there as a form of, of population management and control. So you have to convince people that it's in their interest. And it's like, you know, every man for himself and everyone is out to get everyone. I take my cue from a uh, former general counsel of the NSA, Stuart Baker, who said on this question, metadata absolutely tells you everything about somebody's life. If you have enough metadata, you don't really need content. It's sort of embarrassing how predictable we are as human beings. So let's say that you make a phone call um, one night, you call up um a suicide hotline, for example, you're feeling down, you call that hotline, um, and then you know, a few hours later maybe you call a friend, a few hours later you call a doctor, you send an email, and so on and so forth. Now, the contents of, that, of those calls and those emails are not necessarily being collected. What's being collected is the time of the call, the, the place that you called, and so sometimes in events like that, those different pieces of metadata can be linked together to profile someone. David's description of what you can do with metadata, and quoting a mutual friend, Stuart Baker, is absolutely correct, okay? We kill people based on metadata. But that's not what we do with this metadata. Thankfully. <laughs> wow, I was working up a sweat there for a second. You know, the impetus for governments for conducting this kind of surveillance is often, at least in rhetoric, to go after terrorists. And obviously we don't want terrorism, and so that, that, uh, that justification resonates with most of the public. But I think that there's a couple problems with it. The first 
is that they haven't demonstrated to us that surveillance actually works in stopping terrorist attacks. We haven't seen it work yet. It didn't work in Paris. It didn't work in Boston. It didn't work elsewhere. So that's one part of it. But then I think the other part of it is that we spend billions of dollars on surveillance and on war, but spend very little money on addressing the root causes of terrorism. I had this debate Sicherheit versus Freiheit from Popans. Denn diese Werte stehen sich nicht gegenüber. Und ich kaufe diese Propaganda auch nicht mehr. Das ist schlicht, weil viele der Maßnahmen, die wir in den letzten zehn Jahren über uns ergehen lassen mussten, in puncto staatlich erzwungene Überwachung, kein mehr an Sicherheit bedeuten. Und ich schon deshalb diese Debatte darum, ob wir Freiheit opfern für mehr Sicherheit, ähm, nicht mehr führen mag. I think power is, is concealed in the whole discourse around surveillance. And the way it's concealed is through this legitimization that it's in your interest, that it keeps you safe. And so, but there have been uh, many instances where citizens groups have actually fought against that kind of surveillance. And I think there's also sort of the mystique around the technologies of surveillance. There is the whole sort of like this notion that Ah, because it's a technology and it's designed to do this, it's actually working. But all of this is a concealment of power relations because who can surveil who is the issue, right? It, it isn't the majority of the English population here who gets stopped and searched. It's, it's um, non-white people. Um, it isn't the majority of um, non-white people who get approached to, you know, inform on their community, it's, it's Muslim communities. Surveillance that one does on the other, you know. So at the airport, it's the other passengers that say, ah, so-and-so is speaking in Arabic. Um, and therefore that person becomes the subject, right? Uh, the target of that hyper surveillance. So it's the kind of surveillances that are being exercised by each of us on the other because of this sort of like culture of fear that has been uh, nourished in a way and that's mushrooming all around us. And these are fears that I think are, they go anywhere from the most concrete to the most vague. In, in this way, I think this is another way of um, creating a semblance of control where um, this, this identity is very easily visible, it's very easily targeted and it's very easily defined. Für mich ist die politische Diskussion eine reine Angstdiskussion, wo man die Ängste der Menschen, die eher berechtigt sind, ausnutzt und wo man auch rassistische Stereotype wiederholt. Und ich hätte das für ausgesprochen gefährlich, dem immer mehr nachzugeben. Auch, weil ich glaube, dass man natürlich damit sehr negative Instinkte bei Menschen verstärkt. Ausgrenzung, uh, auch uh, racial profiling. It's uh, inherently disenfranchising, it's disempowering and it's isolating. When you feel you're being treated as a different person to the rest of the population, that's when measures like surveillance, um, things that are enabled by technology, really hit home and, and, and cause, uh, um, you know, and, and, and cause you to sort of change the way you feel as a subject. Because at the end of the day, you are you are a subject of a government. Wie kommt es denn, dass diese Massenüberwachungsprogramme jahrelang geheim gehalten wurden, wenn sie angeblich so sinnvoll und effektiv sind? Warum hat sich denn niemand dafür öffentlich gerechtfertigt? Warum wurde es dann alles im Geheimen von geheimen Gerichten mit geheimen Gerichtsurteilen gerechtfertigt? Warum kommt die Kommission von Geheimdienstlern, die eigens Obama eingesetzt hat nach Beginn der neuen Veröffentlichung, zu dem Ergebnis, dass Kein einziger Null der Fälle von Terror oder Terror, versuchten Terroranschlägen durch diese riesenhaften Telekommunikationsmetadaten auch nur im Ansatz geklärt wurde. In trying to stop something from happening before it happens, um, they can put in a, a measure and that thing might not happen. But they don't know if that measure stopped that thing from happening because that thing never happened. It's hard to measure, you can't measure it. And you can't say with certainty that it's because of this measure that that didn't happen. But after 9-11, after you know, the catastrophic level of that attack, um, it put decision makers into this 
um, impossible position where citizens were scared, they needed to do something. One part of that is trying to um, screen everybody objectively and have that sort of panopticon surveillance of saying that no, no, we, we can see everything, don't worry, you know, we have, we have the haystack, we just need to find the needle. Uh, but then, you know, obviously they need ways to target that. You can see it most clearly over here, you got um, leaflets through your door a few years ago, um, basically saying, um, has, if you've seen anything suspicious, call this hotline. And it listed things like um, the neighbour who goes away on holiday um, like many times a year or, you know, uh, if like, you know, another neighbour whose curtains are always drawn, you know, it, it just changes the way you look, you look at society, you look at yourself um, and it shifts the presumption of innocence to a presumption of guilt already. Um, wann ist jemand? Ja, ein potenzieller Selbstmordattentäter. Damit äh, fängt das ja Problem an, nicht? Wenn er ähm, einen Sprengstoffgürtel trägt und äh, den Zünder schon in der Hand hält, oder wenn er sich äh, bereits Bauteile für einen Sprengstoffgürtel äh, besorgt hat, oder wenn er sich erst im Internet darüber informiert hat, wie man einen Sprengstoffgürtel äh, bastelt. Ne? Wann darf der Staat rechtmäßig eingreifen? Für mich geht es da ganz zentral um die ähm, sehr problematische Frage, ob jemand, der ein potenzieller Gefährder, als ein potenzieller Gefährder oder als ein potenzieller Terrorverdächtiger eingestuft worden ist, ohne ein Terrorist zu sein, ja, ob so jemand deswegen rechtmäßig überwacht werden darf oder sogar festgenommen werden darf. Das heißt, ob gewissen Personen dadurch, dass sie eine konkrete Gefahr für die Gemeinschaft darstellen könnten, fundamentale Menschenrechte abgesprochen werden dürfen. Und d'abord, nous faisons face à à une menace inégalée qui va durer. mode de vie, à notre art de vie. Mais nous pensons aussi qu'il faut l'union de la sécurité et tous les éléments constitutifs. For over 15 years now, we have observed a big populist push to adopt even more uh, surveillance measures with the attacks of the past years. There was an opportunity to pass even more. We have this proposal for a new directive whose contents are purely based on ideology. Als Antiterrorismusrichtlinie wurde der im Eilverfahren durchgebrachte Gesetzestext verabschiedet. Der grünen Abgeordnete Jan Philipp Albrecht schrieb in einer Stellungnahme an Netzpolitik.org, was die Richtlinie als Terrorismus definiert, könnte von Regierungen genutzt werden, um politische Aktionen oder politischen Protest zu kriminalisieren. These uh, type of laws actually are neutral in principle. In practice, they are very discriminatory. If you talk to any politician right now at the EU level or, or at the national or local level, they will tell you that most likely these people are Muslims. Historisch und philosophisch ist äh, dieses Problem uns äh, längst bekannt. Nicht? Also wir neigen immer dazu, alles was uns unangenehm ist, was uns unheimlich ist, ja, an den Horizont zu stellen. Das ist uns fremd. Ja. Das tun andere, wir nicht. Ja. Und wenn, wenn es unser einer tut, dann muss er verrückt sein. And this is Edward Said's point of view, right? That the Western self came to define itself in relation to this Eastern other. So everything that the West was, the East wasn't. And everything that the East was, the West wasn't. And so the East became this province of emotionality, irrationality, and the West became this source of reason, everything controlled and contained and so forth. And it's this dichotomy that continues to play itself out. Terrorismus tauchte auf als Begriff zum ersten Mal im Kontext der Französischen Revolution. Die Jakobiner, die unter Robespierre die Schreckensherrschaft errichtet hatten, also La Terreur, 
Das waren die ersten Terroristen, so wurden sie genannt. Der erste Terrorismus war der Terrorismus des Staates. Und dazu gehörte natürlich auch die systematische Überwachung von Konterrevolutionären. The proposal of the directive says that it complies with human rights. Uh, it actually does not, because they want to increase surveillance measures in order for the population to feel safer. However, we've seen that more repressive measures do not necessarily mean that you would have more security. And the way you sell it to people is to appease their sense of anxieties around, oh, this is an insecure world. Anything could happen at any time, right? And so if anything can happen at any time, what can we do about it? You get the feeling that this text is trying to make sure that law enforcement will be able to get access to communications by any means that they wish. To be able to stop something from happening before it happens, you have to know everything. You have to look at the past, look at what's happened, but then also predict the future by looking at the past and then getting as much information as you can on everything, all the time. So it's about you know, zero risk. Alle entwickelten Demokratien haben so eine Art Konzept wie Verhältnismäßigkeit, wie das hier in Deutschland genannt wird, dass man eben Überwachungsmaßnahmen gegeneinander abwiegt, äh, nämlich auf der anderen Seite die Grundrechte zu beachten hat. Und dazu gehört zweifelsohne ähm, die Privatsphäre. In Deutschland ist sie ja sehr hoch angesiedelt, sie wird unmittelbar von der Menschenwürde abgeleitet und die ist nur in sehr geringem Maße verhandelbar. When we are afraid to speak, either because of our government coming after us or because of a partner or a boss or whomever. Um, you know, all sorts of surveillance causes self-censorship, but I think that mass surveillance, the idea that everything we're doing is being collected, can cause a lot of people to think twice before they open their mouths. When all your likes uh, can be traced back to you, of course it affects your behavior. Of course it's usually the case that sometimes you think if you like this thing or if you don't, then you would, it would have some social repercussions for you. But if you look throughout history, the Reformation, um, the gay rights movement, all of these movements were illegal in some way, if not by law strictly, then by um, culture. And if we'd had that kind of mass surveillance then, would we have had those movements? If all laws were absolutes, then we would never have progressed to the point where women had equal rights because women had to break the laws that said you can't have equal rights. Black people in America had to break the laws that said that they could not have equal rights. And there's a common thread here. You know, a lot of our laws historically have had the harshest effects on the most vulnerable in society. Die Komponente, dass man damit auch meint, äh, wenn du was zu verbergen hast, bist du ja auch selber schuld, die ist aus meiner Sicht erst in den letzten Jahren hinzugekommen. Insbesondere äh, der ehemalige Chef von Google, Eric Smith, der ist natürlich dafür bekannt, dass er das auch tatsächlich so gesagt hat. If you have something that you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Aber das natürlich in einer Weise menschenfeindliche, die ist schon fast wieder lustig, ja, da könnte man eigentlich schon wieder denken, das ist Satire. Viele Menschen können nichts dafür, dass sie Dinge zu verbergen haben in einer Gesellschaft, die ungerecht ist. But if you really need that kind of privacy, the reality is that search engines, including Google, do retain this information for some time. Big corporations that have this business model of people farming are interested in you because you are the raw materials, right? Your information is the raw materials. What they do is they process that to build a profile of you. And that's where the real value is. Because if I know enough about you, if I have so much information about you that I can build a very lifelike, constantly evolving picture of you, uh, a simulation of you, that's very valuable. The economy of the net is predicting human behavior so that eyeballs can be delivered to advertising and that's targeted advertising. The system in one way is set up for them to make money and sell our little bits of data, our interests, our demographics for other people and for advertisers to, to be able to sell things. And these companies know more about us than we know about ourselves. Right now we're feeding the beast. 
it has to reach one person the same ad at a particular time. If at 3 p.m. you buy this soda and you eat your lunch, then for how about 2.55 you get an ad about discount of a pizza place next door or a salad place and where exactly the soda comes. That's what targeted advertising is. It's true, it is convenient. Um, you know, I, I always laugh every time I'm on a site and looking at, let's say, a sweater that I want to buy and then I move over to another site and that, an advertisement for that same sweater pops up and reminds me how much I want it. Um, it's both convenient and annoying. It's a pity that some of the greatest minds of our century are only wondering how to make you look at some advertisement. And that's where the surveillance economy begins, I would say, and not just ends. To a lot of people that may seem much less harmful, but the fact that they're capturing that data means that that data exists and we don't know who they might share it with. There's a whole new business now, you know, data brokers who draw upon, you know, thousands of data points and create client profiles to sell to companies. You know, you don't really know what happens with those kind of things. So it's hard to tell what the implications are until it's too late, until it's happened. The Stasi, compared to Google or Facebook, were amateurs. The Stasi actually had to use people to surveil you, to spy on you. That was expensive. It was time-consuming. They had to pick targets. They, it was very expensive for them to have all of those people spying on people. Facebook and Google don't have to do that. They use algorithms. That's the mass in mass surveillance. The fact that it is so cheap, so convenient to spy on so many people. And it's not a conspiracy theory. You don't need conspiracies when you have the simplicity of business models. When, when we talk about algorithms, we actually talk about a logic. When you want to, for example, buy a book on Amazon, you have always uh, seen a few other suggestions. These suggestions are produced for you based on a history of your preferences, a history of your searches. They learn by making mistakes. And the thing is, you know, that's fine if it's like selling uh, dog food. But <laughs> if it's about predictive policing and about creating a matrix where you see which um, individuals are threatening, that's not okay. To me, you know, there has to be limits, there has to be lines. Um, and these are all the dynamics that are coming from the bottom up. These are all the discussions that need to be had, but they need to be had with all the actors. They can't just, it can't just be an echo chamber. You can't talk to the same people who agree with you. So one consequence of this would be many minorities or many people who have minority views would be silenced. And we always know that when a minority view is silenced, it would empower them in a way and it would radic radicalize, radicalize them in the long run. This is one aspect. The other is that um, you would never be challenged by anyone who disagrees with you. We have to understand that our data is not exhaust. Our data is not oil. Data is people. You may be not doing anything wrong today, but maybe three governments from now, when they pass a certain law, what you have done today might be illegal, for example. And governments that keep that data can look back over 10, 20 years and maybe start prosecuting. When everything we, we buy, uh, everything we read in a way, and every, even, even the people we meet and date is determined by these algorithms. I think the amount of power that they exert on, on, on the society and on individuals in the society is more than the, the states to some degree. Um, so there I think representative democracies have the duty to push, uh, to push the government to open up these private entities to at least expose to some degree how much control they exert. Wenn man die technologische Perspektive einnimmt und sich natürlich klar macht, dass die Technik noch sehr viel mehr in unser Leben hineinrutschen wird, als sie ohnehin schon ist. Also auch wirklich technisch in unsere Körper, in unsere Kleidung, in, in die Geräte, in denen wir sitzen und die wir tragen, ja, in alle möglichen Bereiche unseres Zusammenlebens und unseres Arbeitslebens, dann ist das definitiv der falsche Weg. Weil er letztlich zu einer totalitären Überwachung führt, die eigentliche Dichotomie besteht aus Kontrolle, 
versus Freiheit. Und eine vollständig kontrollierte Gesellschaft kann nicht frei sein.